to reflect upon you as you reflect on your last decade upon my experiences over the last 10 years in my own country. And I want to see whether some of the things that I can um, learn myself, if you like, as a teaching to myself, might also be of interest to you. So I'm going to address three particular topics over the next 30, 40 minutes. I'm going to tell you about how we have formulated and then, I think, remarkably implemented a national mental health plan. Now, I need to add a sort of uh, a word of explanation. I'm not talking about the British experience. We now have devolved policies for I Northern Ireland, Wales, Scotland, and England. So I'd be shot if I went home again talking about the British experience. So I'm going to talk about the English experience, so let that be clear. <laughs> That's for the camera. <laughs> So I'm then getting the second part of my talk to, to tell you about how this national policy, this statement of intent, actually changed services where I work, along with my colleague Dr. Slade in South London, to see what we did step by step in real world everyday practice. And then I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that I feel I've learnt uh, from going through these, these stages, uh, about what might be done better from what's gone well and also not gone well uh, from my own experience. First, then about the background in terms of policy. So, no, let me just, I'll tell you as a story, effectively. About 11 years ago, I got uh, a phone call from the office of our health minister. Now, this does not happen every day for me. And so I went along not knowing why. And I was ushered into this large room, almost as big as this room, and there was a sofa, a sort of a easy chair. And I was invited to sit on this easy chair and have a cup of tea with the minister. And I thought, I've either done something very well or very wrong. <laughs> What's happening here? And he then he had this sort of, it became clear, it was a getting to know you type session. He wanted to know if I was a person he could do business with. So he talked about nothing much for half an hour. And then he said, um, I would like to invite you to lead uh, a new national mental health policy. So my first thought is, me? <laughs> um, uh, my second thought was, you know, is he serious? So I said, well... Um, you know, what is it you have in mind, Minister? You know, is it something ambitious and, you know, aspirational but not going to actually change the real world at all? Or something sort of tokenistic and very, very modest and sort of status quo? He said, no, I want you to be ambitiously realistic. And those two words made me think, yep, I want to do this. So I took him up. So... I then got together um, with a series of colleagues from around the country, England, and I'm going to tell you about what we, we created. So the background is that we know, as here, as many other countries, we've seen a progressive uh, reduction in the number of beds. I won't go into the details. You've seen this from other countries already during this conference. And here, for example, I'm afraid this comes out very poorly, but you can see in Israel, this is Israel, you can see that you have dropped over what, 60% of your beds also in the last 20 years, like many other economically advanced nations. And this is what's happened. In fact, in my country now, it's pretty much stabilized. We've now got 40-odd thousand beds for a population of about 45, 50 million. So this is what we created. Um, strangely enough, it's not called a, a plan or a policy. It's called National Service Framework. And in fact, there were then frameworks for cancer, for diabetes, for a whole series of disorder or uh, health categories. And the first thing we did was to gather together so-called stakeholder groups, uh, 70 people, in fact, and all the groups you think should be included pretty much were, and every single group came to me at some point in this of nine-month gestation process and said, we are severely underrepresented. So the service users came to me and said, we, we demand, no, they didn't suggest, they, we demand that at least half of all the participants in this policy formation must be service users. And in fact, the number was about 10%. And psychiatrists, psychologists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, nurses, like everybody came and said, we are grossly, grossly underrepresented. And I thought that was great because they all wanted to be in this particular boat uh, fighting their corner. So we did it very quickly. The, the actual writing took place over about six months. We split into small working groups. And then, um, to my amazement, the government published it more or less as we recommended. And this has then been the national policy for the last 10 years. Um, if you go to our Department of Health government website, you can see the, the, all the details and the background. So what was the terms of reference? What was the shape of this from the outset? Well, the, the health minister said to me, uh, it should, 
this so-called NSF, I shall call it, set national standards. So that was important. It was going to set benchmarks for achievement, not just saying improve this or try to do that, but quite specific numerical standards in a number of domains. Defining service models. So again, not saying you know, do rehabilitation, but quite specific programs and models were to be described, and our job is to say which and why, what's the evidence base. Promoting mental health and treating mental illness, and each of these key terms is very important. Our health service until that stage has never seriously said one of the jobs of the National Health Service is to accept responsibility for promotion and for prevention and for stigma reduction, and this time it did. Put in place underpinning programs, so not just the standards, but the programs had to be defined quite specifically that would achieve those standards to support local delivery and establish milestones. And from the beginning, we were asked to set out some step ladders of by 2002, this percentage of that, by 2004, this percentage of this is on, to get up to the delivery targets that were about to be set. And that was the shape that was clear. So we set up this um, so-called um, uh, stakeholder or reference group. And interestingly, I chaired this group together with the, the leading mental health civil servant in the Ministry of Health. And that was an interesting process in its own right. So it's five or six months altogether, and all these groups are involved. And the first thing we did, um, and people saying, I, we must have you know, home treatment, we must have day hospitals, we must have, and we said, no, we're not going to talk about practicalities or components or specifics at all yet, because we come from such different backgrounds, we've all got different value and frameworks, and we're going to spend, first of all, a lot of time thinking about the underlying values and principles. So everybody went away, and it was very much like this. We had some sort of 70-odd people in a hotel for a weekend, and the, my message was to everybody, we're not leaving until we have got an agreement on the fundamental values and principles which will underpin everything else as a sort of foundation, or the rock, if you like, on which we will build this policy. And we had a very active series of engagements throughout all of these two days where people came, they clashed, some people said, what's a value, what's a principle, is it the same, is it different? And then we had about, I don't know, 25 different values that we sort of rated. Um, now I'd probably call it a nominal group process. Then it was just a lots and lots of iterative discussions. And we did achieve that. And this is what we said. People with mental health problems can expect that services will. So it's right from the start, the person with a mental health condition or problem is put center stage about what they're going to get, what their perspective is, what they can expect, to be fulfilled by the service providers who have a secondary interest, involves service users and carers in planning and delivery, so involvement. Delivering high quality treatment care which is known to be effective and acceptable, so effective, evidence-based and acceptable. Be suited to those who use them and non-discriminatory. And quite a lot of this is sort of condensed, it's also code, so non-discriminatory is you know, as little stigmatizing as humanly possible, given what we know. And, and uh, well suited basically means not racist, not giving poorer quality experience of care to black or minority ethnic groups in our system. Be accessible, and that speaks for itself, promote the safety of the carer staff and the wider public. And this is code, again, because there was a very widespread concern, there still is, among officials and government ministers in particular, about the threat of the violent mentally ill to the public. Continuously undermined by professionals, but often not making a lot of headway, so this code of uh, safety of everybody then says people with mental health problems are more often victims than perpetrators of violence, but we're concerned about safety for everybody. Offer choice, be coordinated, which we just heard from Dr. Hogan about the coordination issue, deliver continuity, empower, and properly accountable. Now, these were the particular values that we, we settled upon. I don't especially recommend these to anybody else because the selection of the Specifics, this is again the specific question, is very particular to that context, that time and that place. And you could easily imagine now, if we had five minutes, you could shout out 20 or 30 values, and then you'd have a discussion about which is most important. But the thing I do want to draw your attention to is that even with these sort of you know, fine-sounding and warm words, there are often, maybe there are necessarily, conflicts and trade-offs between some of these values. So, for example, if I want continuity... Here it is, continuity. And maybe I want to see the same doctor and the same nurse, same psychologist, over five or ten years who really know me, I trust them, and then we have a good relationship. But maybe they're not expert in my particular condition. And if I want effective care, 
then I have to go to this specialist team, and then that specialist team, and then I get discontinuity. So I can't have both at the same time. So it's not, uh, as, it's not as if you can have all of these values delivered simultaneously to everybody. There are always these conflicts, even at the value stage. And interesting, the question of values being set out at the beginning of a law or a policy is becoming a little bit more common. You can see here that in the States, National Institute of Medicine has been putting some, a small number, and I'm a great uh, fan of small lists and small numbers of targets. And also a, a very uh, libertarian law in South Africa introduced a few years ago started in its preamble by making a statement of the underlying values and principles here. Again, quite specific to its context in terms of immediate post-apartheid uh, era. Now, another thing that I found helpful and invigorating in this process is that the government said to me, we want your policy to be as far as possible based upon the evidence but not limited to what the evidence can show. So we use this now what's a fairly standard system here of strength evidence from uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses through to um, this so-called type 5, or this is the lowest form of evidential life. Now this in itself was highly controversial. Consumer groups said, we are the experts, we are the people with the condition and experience, we are the intended beneficiaries, and we know what happens and we know what we need. And all of these fancy trials and so on, that's beside the point, because this is our real sort of grounded experience. Nevertheless, um, um, this particular approach didn't, uh, didn't, uh, was not persuaded by that. And we took this, this standard uh, sort of biomedical evidential approach here. And every type of, uh, all of our recommendations were supported by references from published literature. And each of those studies was then graded according to the strength of evidence. Now, we'll see in a minute that one of the areas that we considered, namely support for family members and caregivers, has almost no good, strong evidence from the top of this list. Nevertheless, we were assured that this is so important we're going to make a recommendation here on the best available evidence, which is actually quite weak from science, but very strong from family members. And then we decided to make our recommendations across, I should say, adult mental health care, uh, excluding dementia in this case, and also excluding uh, children and young people. So we're talking about the sort of general bandwidth of adult care under five headings. Promotion, prevention, and stigma. Primary care, or first level treatment. Severely mentally ill type care. Carers and suicide. So I'll tell you a little bit about what we, if you like, the headlines of what we came up with. There's not time to say why for all of these. So the first one is that health and social services, again, just to sort of unpack this a little bit, these two agencies together share a joint responsibility for this particular standard. Promote mental health care, combat discrimination. Now, before this, we had had a separate government agency called the Health Education Agency, which is supposed to go forth and offer uh, behavior-changing interventions through advertising, whatever, which meant that the health service Providers, doctors, nurses could say, well, I'm not an expert at talking to school children or journalists. We have this other agency. I'm sorry, I'm very busy seeing patients in my clinic. And this, this new policy said, no, mental health care jointly has this responsibility to do active things, preferably to do evidence-based things to, to avoid and to reduce stigma. And no longer could they step aside and say, very important, but that's not for me. Second is primary care. Again, the standard, this is the starting point, before we got to the percentages and the numbers, any service user who contacts the primary care team with a common mental health problem, meaning anxiety or depression or both, most often, should, so you can see it's a, it's a strong uh, in, in incentive or injunction, should have their mental health needs identified and assessed be offered effective treatments, including referral if necessary. Now this is making it quite clear to primary care staff of all disciplines that their job does include all the mental health basic level uh, in the population. That it is not acceptable for an individual or a group of primary care practitioners to say, well, we, you know, we know about physical things, that's our training, you know, specialists are needed for these difficult mental type people. No, that's not acceptable. Their job is to make the first level assessment, and it's quite clear in this national policy. And 
that they should be available to do this around the clock. Not just when individuals are on duty, but the service should provide uh, continuous availability for crises. And also with a, a phone support system available to, to advise people. <coughs> Next we come then to people who are more directly related to the rehabilitation part of your spectrum. Um, in our system it's called severe mental illness. And it says all mental health service users having a case manager, and in our system, if you have a severe mental illness, then if you like, by definition, you should have a case manager. That's how we match this definition. Should receive care which optimizes engagement, anticipates or prevents a crisis and reduces risk, and have a copy of a written care plan. Now, we heard about your own rehabilitation law, and I was discussing over lunch um, with the author of this, how sometimes the, the, the little words are the important ones. And I think um, you said that it was the, the link with the budgetary allocation, just a small phrase that made all the difference to this taking place in practice. So I, was, I, I, didn't know, I wasn't quite sure why, but I really thought it's important to put that written care plan in. Now, the, the importance of it is that the, each person who has a severe mental illness has to have a written statement, usually for the next year, sometimes next six months, of what care and treatment will be provided for that person. Better if that's negotiated directly with the person concerned, but the, the providers have to have a written statement of that, care, that person's care plan, and the person concerned has to, give a, has to have a written copy of it. So that immediately, at least in principle, they are more empowered because they have that in front of them. They can say, you said you do A, B, and C. You've done A. Why have you not done B and C? If that person's not in a strong position to make a challenge, then their family member, with the person's consent, will also have a copy, and they can come along as well and say, you haven't done B and C. And they often do say that to me, and we have to say, well, let's talk about this. And then it says what should happen in a crisis, how to liaise with the GP, Remembering the GPs still have clear responsibility for the physical health care of these people with longer-term mental disabilities, and that it's regularly reviewed. And then we had lots and lots of debate with these stakeholders about hospitals and about crises and about... Because again and again, when we consult service users and also caregivers, family members, that usually the, the, the number one concern is either what shall I do if there's a crisis, or last time there's a crisis, I got pretty bad treatment and I want something better in the future. It's the crisis response that is usually at the top of the list. And we came to a particular form of words. Each service user who's assessed as requiring a period of care away from their home, but also we said, or equivalent, meaning intensive support in a crisis which might also be at home, should have access to appropriate hospital bed or alternative bed or place, in the least restrictive environment and as close to home as possible. And interestingly, even then, because our services have changed, we had in mind that this might actually be in the home if that was acceptable to the person and their family and we were able to give intensive support instead of going to hospital. And again, have a copy of a written aftercare plan. Again, making it quite clear what we intend and would like to be held to deliver for that person. I mentioned that, that the evidence. Uh, we had strong uh, contributions from family member groups, and we did not have a strong contribution from evidence because there isn't strong evidence about effective interventions for family members. Nevertheless, we set one standard specifically for family members. Individuals who provide regular and substantial care for a person with a care coordinator should have an assessment of their own caring, physical, and mental health needs and have their own written care plan. Now this was something quite, for me, quite unexpected. So it's not a question of assessing the patient, if you like, or the consumer. This is a separate assessment, usually in the absence of the consumer, of what that family member, what that carer needs. So it's a carer's needs assessment. Um, so last Friday, I had had a family meeting, one of these review meetings, with um, a 40-year-old man with bipolar disorder and his parents. And it's quite a difficult meeting. We eventually finished, and I sort of sighed and went for a cup of tea. And then I get a phone call saying, could I come to have a private meeting with the parents? And I thought I'd dealt with quite complicated issues, so I said, uh, yes, I'm happy to. Uh, sigh. <laughs> and they, they had some issues about, um, they had concerns about their son they did not want to speak about with him. 
and this was expressed with the care coordinator in the context of a care is needs assessment, which was taking place immediately after the formal review of that person, the patient's care. And then I sort of discussed with them about their concerns. Now, this has been, if you like, less well implemented. It's taken 10 years to even get perhaps 30, 40, 50% of carers having their needs assessed. It's a slow process. And staff will typically say, well, you know, this is very, very good in principle, but we're actually very busy just assessing the patients. You know, we haven't, don't have time. It's not that important. But you then exert continuous expectations and pressure and reward and incentives for doing so, and you man monitor it. So we now know exactly what percentage of carers' assessments are done sort of month by month for the whole organisation. And then we came and discussed suicide. We spent a lot of time discussing suicide. And we had a problem because the evidence is so weak, because the events are so rare, comparatively, that doing research, you either have huge populations or you have very long follow-ups to get a number of um, completed suicides. The research is not strong. And what we eventually concluded is that the best way to prevent suicides is by implementing all of the above. So standards one to six, if <coughs> implemented, would contribute to suicide reduction, uh, with one exception. We added in a specific that everybody leaving hospital being discharged from an inpatient stay should have a face-to-face -face contact with a mental health professional within uh, seven days because we knew that a very high risk time was the period immediately on leaving a hospital ward. The numbers are fairly slow, but it, low, but it's a very high risk period. So we wanted an immediate, usually within two or three days in fact, contact with a member of staff to see how somebody's getting on. And then we added in some of the details on top of that, that sort of general framework of standards. We said that across all of England, every area, an area for us is about a quarter of a million, should have an early intervention team. And this is, for those of you who are at my talk on Monday, this is in addition to local generic mental health teams, often for maybe 60,000, 70,000 population. In addition to that, we insert at this quarter of a million population an early intervention team for people in first or second episodes of a psychotic disorder. And again, we had targets. We said there'd be 50 established in three years, and then in fact over six years, these were established across the whole of the country. And there was a monitoring process every quarter to see which areas had established these teams. We then established something similar to but not the same as assertive community treatment teams. This is a sort of slightly, well, you could say adapted to our context, you could say watered down, but it was a different thing because we did not insist on these teams having 24-hour coverage, we did not insist that they had a dual diagnosis practitioner, and we did not say that they had to have a vocational rehabilitation worker within the team. But they were dedicated to having low caseloads of maybe 15 people per case manager for complex people with long-term disabilities, usually, to do with psychotic disorders. And again, we had quite specific targets, numbers of people covered, numbers of teams, tracked year by year to see if we were getting to those targets. And actually quite strong financial penalties for organizations that did not meet targets. So re rewards, incentives, and sanctioned and paid penalties to provider organizations. And again, this, these are all in addition to the general teams, early intervention, assertive outreach, and home treatment teams per district, so per, sorry, per quarter of a million population. And these are teams to both make an assessment of somebody's home and to offer treatment at home for up to a month, for example, by going to the house two or three times a day. Now, it was even stronger than that. In many organizations, this became the only gatekeeper to a hospital admission. So if I'm working in a community mental health team, not this team but another one, and I would like to admit a person to hospital, I can't. I phone up the team and say, could you assess them, please? And they make the decision about whether the person goes into hospital or not. And this, uh, this was very uh, interesting to introduce that change. Um, and if you want to know more about that whole model, there's this book by Sonia Johnson and colleagues. I'm one of the authors about this whole approach. Sometimes they're called home treatment teams. Sometimes they're called crisis resolution teams. In our system, it's exactly the same. They're just two words for the same thing. And do they work? Well, um, interesting, the evidence for these is not strong because it's, there are not many countries which have implemented them, and they haven't been uh, systematically studied in, in many countries. 
Here's one um, sort of large-scale secular assessment by Professor Glover. So while we were halfway through implementing these teams all over the country, he had access to admission rates where they were implemented or not. And he, in fact, had a, made a three-way comparison. Districts that did not have a home treatment team, districts that had one in the daytime, and districts that had them 24 hours. And essentially, he found that if you had a daytime treatment team, then you could cut admissions by 10%. And if you had a 24-hour crisis resolution team, then you cut the admissions by 23%. And this was very helpful because before this, where I worked in South London, we had a bed occupancy rate of about 125%, uh, which sounds impossible, but it meant people were formally in beds, home at the weekend on leave, somebody else was sleeping in their bed during the weekend. And this meant that we could bring down more or less the numbers of people in hospital to the bed provision, more or less in, well, in balance, eight, 100%. Maybe it should be 80 but actually it was more like 100%. So this made a, a big difference to that extra degree of pressure that was uh, really very difficult in our system. Okay, so that's a bit about the, the policy nationally. What was this like then, you know, for me working as a psychiatrist in South London? And I'll take you through a bit of a longer time scale to see how we've dealt with this. So this is where, again, Dr. Slade and I work. It's um, historically called The Maudsley. It's now, in fact, a provider organization where the majority of staff are outside of hospital called the South London Maudsley Trust. And we cover a whole population of about 1.2 population. Um, for those who know London, this, was, uh, this is the Big Ben here. That's the big wheel on the Thames. So this is a large chunk of southeast London. And one of the things we did is to actually close a lot of hospitals locally. We closed this hospital, which had been open typically for 100 years, and closed entirely. It's now uh, luxury apartments in the green belt just outside London. Uh, to start with, and this was in 1991, 1992, we then literally cut the map, map up into set sectors. We drew lines. It meant that on the basis of your zip code or your postcode, then we knew exactly which team you would be looked after. These are the small general adult teams that we developed for about a population of 60, 70,000. And we developed these teams simply by closing, by taking staff physically out of wards. So we reduced the number of beds, took those staff out, put them, gave them basic training initially, then ongoing training until they got more confidence and competence, and created these community teams. Now, this is one of our earlier ones. Uh, this is my colleague, Dr. Schmuckler, that some of you may know. And we, deliberately, in the first case, we call this a Camberwell <coughs> interim team. We had a lot of people who said to us, this will it'll not come to any good. This will all go terribly wrong. You will have people in prison, we'll have people homeless in the gutter, we'll have more homicides, you know, you'll learn Thornycroft. And so we said, well, you know, we don't have the evidence in England for this, so let, let's try it and see. But we called an interim team, we said, we'll try out this team for one year and then review, and if it's going badly wrong, then the staff go back into the ward and we'll say, well, didn't work. But after a year it was going fine and we had more and more teams then developed. So we didn't, we took away the interim word. And then we built up more and more um, <coughs> buildings and centers and facilities in the community. This is one, um, about a mile from our main hospital site, and it was um, a children's clothes shop. Interestingly, it then became too small, and it's now a children's clothes shop again, because <laughs> it, it was rented. So we had a lot of flexibility by not buying property, by renting property. So the, how did we know which direction of travel? Well, we wanted services that were, that were close to or at people's homes, that there was little, at least geographical, barrier to accessing care. An intervention specific to the range of needs for that particular person, including the preferences and priorities of the, each service user, which are coordinated between the levels of care, and also, where possible, were either based on evidence or generated evidence to test out <laughs> whether we were actually producing a conferring benefit through the, the new services. Uh, we worked with a whole series of stakeholders. In fact, um, Professor Drake and I had an interesting discussion the other day about, I mean, do you talk to neighbors if you're going to open a facility or not? Um, my own view is you talk and talk and talk, but maybe that breaks confidentiality of the residents or the 
the people using the service. And um, this book sort of describes um, a lot of what we did in, in a more structured detail, but at the time, when you're looking back, there's a structure, but at the time, it's very much a type of ad hoc, uh, opportunistic <coughs> approach about establishing the service, seeing where the main, next gap is, establishing the next service, checking what the next gap is. And we then set up, and I won't repeat this because this covers some of the things I mentioned on Monday at the, the main conference, the big conference. And then we sort of, from time to time, we took stock. Um, there's a non-governmental group in England called the King's Fund, and they said, could we write a report about the state of mental health care in London? And we set out a template of what sort of services we thought were necessary, and we then did an inventory. And we, on the basis of the population, we said, well, we expect these numbers of residential care. What have we got? And we could see the actuals and the expecteds, and then we could look at the gap. And um, it was really quite informative to see where the main gaps were. Residential care was one of the biggest gaps that we identified across London. Uh, we then did a formal trial, although not a randomised trial, because some of our local districts had these new services, community mental health teams, and some didn't. And we could compare, if you like, more traditional with the newer mental health teams. And so we had something called the PRISM Psychosis Study, and we did a whole series of assessments about quality of life, satisfaction, economics, symptom outcome, um, and then we published these papers. And effectively what we showed is that the, the new community mental health teams uh, did offer a better, better value and a better outcomes. So more of the needs have met. These are people with psychotic disorders, better quality of life, bigger social networks, and about the same cost. Of course, the cost you put in is really up to what the system decides. And more or less, if you put very little in, then you're going to get poor value. And what we did then, really, over that first decade, was um, looking back, um, maybe actually far too big a change. We went from four hospital sites, the traditional asylums, we closed most of the, two of those down, actually, um, and then we developed lots and lots of these small centres. In fact, overall, 140 of these new physical sites are now beginning to sort of uh, re, uh, re-merge these into slightly fewer. <laughs> this is one. Again, I mentioned this briefly the other day. Uh, this is an alternative hospital admission because it's a house where all the patients or the residents are women, all the staff are women, and it's, people often stay there for three or four weeks, 24 hours, as an alternative to going to hospital. And what we wanted to do step by step is not just to implement what seemed to be a good idea, but then to stop and check and say, let's evaluate it and see if it's actually delivering the goods. So this was an assessment of the women's house, and uh, my colleague, Professor Louise Howard, found that this was acceptable, more acceptable than hospital. We had very bad reports from many women about feeling at risk and vulnerable in inpatient settings. Um, they went to this more quickly. They didn't delay, as they had been going to the hospital. And they also went back to casualty or emergency room less often than previously when they'd been going into hospital for admissions. I mentioned one of the models is the early intervention, designed to give optimal care in the first and second episodes of a psychotic illness, usually to teenagers or people in their early mid-twenties. And we developed a team here in Lambeth. Uh, this is one of the most socially deprived parts of London, called the Lambeth Early Onset, or LEO team. And then... Uh, fortunately, uh, we were able to persuade everybody that we should conduct a randomized control trial. And the trial then, um, uh, this is the actual team, it's six days a week, not seven. And we, in the first um, several years, had 500 odd clients, usually staying for about a year, up to a year in the actual team. So we found that the number of relapses for those people was less if they had this specialized early intervention service. And also, they were more often staying in contact with the service in the first couple of years after their, their initial contact. Now, one of the key themes, um, and it's come up a lot in the last few days, is the, not just the central place in the service, but the central place in all aspects of consumers or service users. And the way in which we've approached this from our research point of view is to deliberately build a team in our own research center of service users. Now, this is, this is, it's not quite dishonest, but it's slightly misleading, because of course, you know, up to 25, 30, 35% of all the staff in our research centre do have or have had a mental illness, because we're just typical of the whole population. But these are people who declare it, 
and who also see that as a strength of what they can bring. Now, often I will meet people who say, oh, so, and do they work with the researchers? And that's not the point. These people are expert researchers already, and they've had an episode of mental illness, and they wish to use that as a combined strength in their approach to the research. You can see here uh, the early team. It's, it's grown to about 10 people uh, more recently. And one of the contributions that they made was a, a systematic review of evidence from consumers about receiving electroconvulsive therapy. This is the paper in the British Medical Journal they published, bringing quite a different understanding to how long memory impairment lasts, uh, how distressing that can be, and also how specific, particularly in autobiographical memory, that can be selectively damaged. Another, in my setting, a very important issue is ethnicity. Um, in many parts of our catchment area, a half the population, sometimes more, are non-white English or British. And on every time we assess ethnic differences in the, experience, the occurrence, the prevalence, the, on, um, the incidence, and the experience of care, then black particularly West African and Caribbean patients, come out worse. So after about 20 years of doing descriptive studies, finding it's worse, now it's still worse, no dear, we decided to start to try to do something about it. So we developed, um, from our understanding of the population, uh, a, a specific team where the staff are black, the, risk, the patients are black, and in this case a team for people with depression and anxiety. We went out not through primary care, because that hadn't been working, but out through points where we expected to be more likely to contact people in distress. In this case, faith communities, usually churches, and barbershops, which are very popular in these areas. And also, we then deliberately mixed the sort of the access point. We didn't say, come in and have your mental health assessed. We actually had a bus that drove around saying, if you'd like a quick blood pressure check, just pop in, and uh, concern about hypertension is, is a high-level issue in, in these black communities. And while they were there, we just had a quick word about how people were feeling, and that might lead to a formal assessment. And here's the head of this clinical service called Dr. Olajide, and we then did a small randomized trial of this particular intervention and found that it was more acceptable to the, um, the consumers, more culturally appropriate, that they recovered from their anxiety and depression faster than in the standard primary care and specialist care model, and it didn't cost any more, it's just about to be published. So we deliberately then had not just a generic set of um, um, innovations for service, but then quite specifically targeted ones to subgroups which had not been doing well in our system. A year or two ago I then wanted to sit down and, and reflect on how I made sense of what had been happening, and then I organized the sort of lessons for me under these ten headings. So the first is about um, the, the difficulties for staff in a process of change. And that in a transition, necessarily everybody, including staff, are going to be having higher levels of uncertainty, concern, anxiety, and so on. And you have to, do, you have to deal with that. You can't just say it will go away or you know, be grown up. And one of the ways we dealt with that is to try and give as many safeguards as possible. So for example, in the transition, uh, my organization said, this is not an excuse for redundancies. Nobody will be made redundant because of these service changes, going from four to 140 community bases. Uh, we will be offering a wide range of choice. Some of my psychiatric colleagues said, over my dead body, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, I'm a doctor, I will stay working in a hospital. And we had to say to them, that's great, because we really want some people who are dedicated to doing high-quality inpatient service. We don't want everybody doing it, but we want some people who are just really, really are good at that. Um, we then offered as much choice as possible, saying, well, there's this new day hospital, there's a new addiction service, there's a new community team, what would you like in the, in the transition? We deliberately had a statement from our senior management from the board saying, uh, a statement on supported risk-taking. Staff felt, well, when there's that murder, that homicide, and by my patient living at home, I'm going to be blamed. So we had a, a very carefully worded statement from our organization saying, you know, if there's been a full assessment of the patient, and it's been discussed with the person concerned in a family if possible, and then discussed in your mental health team with a decision about the plan of care and the alternatives considered and why those were not selected, then our organization will support you, whatever happens. And that was tremendously helpful for staff, fearful of risk-taking, which is, of course, an integral part of 
clinical behaviour being blamed upon them. I mentioned the interim issue and the encouragement to adapt. Second then, um, certainly in the early stages, you lose one of the great advantages of hospitals, which is that lovely, reassuring structure and certainty. So in the community settings, we then deliberately invented sort of synthetic structures, like lots of supervision and teaching and meetings and training. In fact, probably too much, deliberately too much in the first sort of year or two to give a sort of organizational structure as a replacement for the structure of the walls to, to sort of enclose people and to reduce the anxiety. Um, this is the uh, multidisciplinary teams. Now, one of the differences that in my system, um, what we call rehabilitation services usually include all the disciplines, including psychiatrists. So it would be doctors, nurses, occupational therapists, social workers, and psychiatrists, usually in those teams, if they're provided from within the health center. And so this would be a meeting. So one of the elements of structure would be very frequent, often once or twice a day clinical team meetings, so that everybody can get together, not just to share information about clients, but actually to sort of have a good moan and say how difficult it is and give mutual support. Often as well, we had a problem uh, in beginning the new services because we hadn't done it before. How do you start something up? It's like a sort of bootstraps question. And there were some practical ways. We'd visit other sites very often to see how they did it. We would shamefacedly or shamelessly steal um, rotors, job descriptions, operational policies, and then bring them back and adapt them to our purposes. We did have, from within our organization, and the commissioners as well as the providers, um, considerable opposition. Some of it really quite reasonable, saying this is new, is it proven, how do you know this won't be disastrous? And so we had measures such as the interim team I mentioned to try and deal with that. We then had frequently opposition from the local neighbourhoods. Again, you might want to discuss this further. Um, my particular experience is that if anybody is involved, it's neighbours, it's churches, it's police, it's nursery schools, whatever it is in the local vicinity, you talk and talk and talk. You say what you want to do, but more important, you say why you want to do it. And it's not importing dangerous people into the neighbourhood. It's treating people already living there with better quality care, because we all want that, and also the risk can be lower if people are getting good quality care. <laughs> and working in partnership as well with those um, organisations which are actually already in favour. This is one example from Poland with a new... This is actually an employment project. So here you had the Catholic bishop... He had the man from the European Union who was funding it. He had the psychiatrist who was initiating the actual um, project, but deliberately crossing boundaries to get these alliances, these consortia, uh, which are far outside our traditional experience working in the health system. Now, again, we've come across finance quite a bit in the last couple of days, and this is a critical issue. Often you find that the financial structures are from the old hospital days, and then you, have, you want to create something new and the service changes more quickly than the financial structures do. So you end up being creative with the truth. So in some settings we called a day hospital a hospital. So the payments were per day. In fact, the patient wasn't sleeping there at night, but still a per day payment going to the day hospital, this type of thing. So you try to be quite flexible in creating what you have to create using old-fashioned financial structures. Now, certainly in my experience, the, the older hospital-based system had many rigidities, and we had to deliberately inject flexible systems to try to sort of ease that whole thing up and to make it uh, adaptable. Um, we deliberately had people from our system going to visit for a week, a month, uh, or so condiments, maybe for six months, somewhere else. If there's a place with skills, we put them there and said, come back and learn as much as you can and then invest it locally. We deliberately had shadowing, so we had a, a team leader. In our system, a, a mental health, community mental health team leader would be usually a nurse or a social worker, not a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. And we'd give these people special support. We'd train them up, we'd give them lots of support. The, some of the most invaluable people are sort of translators or interpreters. Somebody's worked in a housing department and in a hospital. Somebody's worked in a social services department and in a commissioning authority can speak both languages. And then they can go back in the new role and start translating and speaking languages in, and trying to make 
uh, language work for everybody. That's one of the mental health centres. Um, now, this is, this is where it gets difficult. It's quite easy to think about the individual components. So it could be a community team, it might be a day hospital, it might be a residential care centre. But in my experience, the, a really dangerous thing to do is to let the team running one of these services or these components decide what they're going to do. Because everything else being equal, they will create quite favourable entry criteria. They will say, well, we'll take people who are willing to come here. Uh, we don't take people who have got any forensic history or substance misuse and so on. And what happens is you've got these islands of nice little practice and the really difficult people floating somewhere in between. So you therefore need a senior manager, not just aware of, but in control of the whole system, who can say, no, you can't set your boundaries for that service like that because that excludes these people. And you say to this team, you can't set the, that as your boundaries because that excludes them. And you've got to have boundaries which together cover the whole range of people with needs in the system. And if necessary, knock heads together until you get agreement. Um, the ninth and penultimate issue is about morale. Whether in hospital or in communities, the morale quite often does wane from time to time. And the... I worked for a while at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore in an assertive community treatment team. And they had remarkably high morale. The staff, they weren't whistling all the time, but they were sort of, you know, cheerful. And I, I didn't understand this at all. So I said to the team leader one day, you know, how do you manage this? The staff don't leave, they come in on time, they're really working hard, they're very you know, enthusiastic. How do you manage it? He said, come here, look at this. And he showed me on the wall a big chart. And I said, OK, it's, 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 it's a calendar. He said, yeah, yeah look. And then each day, there is a sort of box. And then about a third of the box is a little red star. So I said, well, what's that then? He said, every time there's a red star, it's somebody's birthday. It could be a client's birthday. It could be a staff's birthday. And every time it's somebody's birthday, then at 3.30, we have coffee and we have cakes. And then everybody gets together. Staff and the clients, they all come together. And it turned out, you know, once or twice, sometimes three times in a week, there was a party. And they, everybody loved it. I mean, cakes, you know, donuts. So they thought that was the one way to help, but it recognised the need to continue to pay attention to the morale of staff for the service to work. And finally then, is the, is, you know, what's the right answer? I remember one time a man came to visit uh, my institute from Burma, and he, he looked at me straight in the eye and said, seriously, how many beds does Burma need? <laughs> and he was really disappointed when I said, I'm afraid not only do I not know, but there's, there's, no, there's no correct answer to that question. It depends entirely upon your priorities, your family support structure, the needs of your population, all the other components which are in play at one time. And so my sense is that there's not a sort of, you know, there's not a correct answer. What there is is what's, what you've got, what exists, and then a process of bringing people together to think seriously about what's the next step. And again and again, I think the touchstone for deciding what's the biggest, what's the most important gap, what we're going to do next, is the experiences of people who are, have the conditions and their family members, who every day are experiencing how the system works, and you're going to give you direct information about what's the biggest gap to fill next. You fill that gap, you then take stock, what's the next biggest gap, and you go ahead and you fill it in sort of like a jigsaw, piece by piece. Okay, so then just to wind up, um, overall, um, I think it's right that changes like this take time. I'm suspicious when people want to rush in reform in a year or two, which can be quite unstable and quite often unravels just as quickly. Quite often when you're starting off a new stage of a policy or a new particular team, you want some charismatic individual sort of persuading people. Um, but they, uh, being charismatic, uh, then tend to disappear after a year. And then what you want is somebody very boring person. And, and especially you want a boring person who's very good at reading spreadsheets and who'll understand how not to let your money be taken away in a process of change, watching it like an eagle. It means deinstitutionalizing many elements, but but actually it deliberately institutionalizing new things like the training curricula. So your junior doctors, your junior nurses spend at least as much time in community teams as they do in inpatient teams to get that whole range of the system as a whole, as well as the sense of the particular bits. And again and again, focusing upon what consumers are saying is the most important thing to do next. Thank you very much for your attention.